everybody! It's Monday, August the 15th, and it's time for the latest edition of The Bullpen with Adam the Bull. On today's show, I get into, what, the first preseason game of the year? Ooh, and the fallout for that. Plus, the Guardians take two out of three from the Blue Jays over the weekend. So a lot to get to today, and uh, of course, today's podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts and where we start is baseball. Yes, indeed. I'll get to the preseason action in Deshaun Watson, but it was a great weekend for the Guardians who deserved the lead here. Uh, the Cleveland Guardians win two out of three over the weekend against the Toronto Blue Jays. So not, you know, they're playing the Tigers doubleheader, start of a series here. But, you know, some of these wins they've piled up recently were over not good teams. But the Toronto Blue Jays are a good team. In fact, the Toronto Blue Jays are just a half game ahead of the Guardians for the third best record in the American League. We know the Astros have the best record. We know the Yankees have been slumping. Oh, yeah, the Guardians can't beat the Yankees. They have it in the regular season. They haven't done well against them. Yankees are not playing good baseball. They've lost eight of their last ten. They uh, have not played well since the All-Star break. Nobody's infallible, okay? And uh, um, if the Guardians end up as the three seed in the division winner, maybe they don't have to play both the Yankees and Astros. They'll likely have to play one. There's a chance they'd have. To, there's a good chance they have to play two, but it's not a guarantee because of these series. And that's why I wanted the Guardians to be aggressive. But we are where we are, okay? The team is what it is, and it's now eight games over 500. Uh, which matches the season high from after winning Friday. They lost Saturday. They won Sunday. And uh, obviously they pitched well this weekend. They hit well in two of the three games. And that's why they sit uh, eight games over 500, a two-and-a-half game lead over both the Twins and the White Sox. The Guardians have played 114 games, right? Is that is that correct math? 114 games, which means they have 48 games left on the season. Again, my math skills can sometimes be off, but I think I'm right about that. Uh, the Guardians, if they just played 500 baseball the rest of the way, 48 games, it's 24 wins, that'll be 85 wins. That will make the playoffs probably. They play a little better than that, which they have obviously to this point. Who knows? I mean, this team could win 90 games this year. I, I, I think that my guess is they'll fall just shy of that, but I think they're going to win in the mid to upper 80s. And that would be remarkable because I thought this team was a 500 team at best coming into the season. I thought they had a chance to hang around in the division heading into September, uh, be you know slightly in the mix only because I didn't think the division was that good. But obviously the division's been worse than I expected, and the Guardians have been better than I expected. And uh, right now you have to like the Guardians' chances of winning the division. The Twins are not playing well. They have not played well since the break. They're only three games over 500 after losing both Saturday and Sunday. The White Sox have, you know, uh, had a nice weekend and got three games over 500, but they've been a completely inconsistent team. They've had a ton of injuries, uh, and the Guardians have been lucky in that area. Uh, you know, the Guardians have played well. They've uh, overachieved, in my opinion. Not that they don't have talent, but it's it's a lot of young talent, and there's been growing pains, and they don't have a ton of players playing great. But they they find a way. They got a couple of you know key guys, even Jose Ramirez, who who you know had his moments this weekend hit the, hit a home run, but he hasn't played great since the thumb injury. He's been you know I'd say above average. He's not been superstar level, MVP level that we saw earlier in the season, and uh, obviously. The combination of Jimenez and Rosario. Now, listen, we don't, you know, this whole thing about like everybody's killing Francisco Lindor. It's stupid. Francisco Lindor is playing well for the Mets. Okay, so it's not like the Mets got destroyed. It's fine. You you can acknowledge that Lindor is playing well, but you wouldn't take the trade back right now because both Jimenez and Rosario are playing great. For the Guardians, uh, you know, Rosario got off to a terrible start this season. He was awful. I'd say almost to the end of May, he was just really struggling. And since then, I don't—I can't remember the exact date the turnaround happened. I, I want to say it was in late May at some point. And he has been absolutely phenomenal uh, since the late portion of May. He's hitting almost 290. 
His OPS is 740, which is not amazing. You know, it's a little above average. But considering how poorly he was playing early in the season and what his OPS was in late May to, towards the end of May, I mean, since then he's been great. I bet he has a, an OPS over eight, uh, definitely over eight since then. Uh, he affects, you know, the, the Guardians, the one thing they do really well that a, not a lot of other teams do is they, they run the bases and they steal, you know, like in a, in a league now where it's so much about power, both power arms and, and power at the plate, you know, the Guardians don't have a ton of power. They only have three guys with more than eight home runs. That's it. Jose's got 22, Jimenez has 12, and uh, Naylor's got 15. That's it. I mean, they don't have a ton of power on this team. I think Rosario's fourth on the team with eight homers. Uh, no, Fran, well, Fran Miel, who's now on the Cubs, has nine. But they, they, they're not a big power lineup, but they run the bases well. They get on base. Um, they steal bases. You got five guys on this team with double-digit steals. Jimenez has 15, Ramirez has 14, Straw has 13, Quan has 12, and Rosario has 11. And Ramirez and Quan and Rosario and Jimenez, uh, Naylor to some degree, um, have all done a good job. Nah, I shouldn't even say to some degree. Naylor as well have done a good job of getting on base and being productive without a ton of power. And so they've done enough offensively. Uh, you know, they're still getting very little production out of catcher, but they're able to make up for it in other places. They're, they're getting just enough production at the right times. They're playing overall pretty good defense. There are some holes defensively. We know that. But uh, And then the pitching, right? You know, obviously McKenzie and Bieber, for the most part, have been really good this year. McKenzie's been great. Bieber... At times, you worry about him because he just doesn't have – he's just not the Cy Young pitcher he once was. But maybe he's adjusting and kind of learning how to pitch with not the same stuff. He's still really good. He's just not elite like he was a few years ago. Uh, and, and you know, Quantrill and, and Plesak have been better. You hope you can get, you know, at least solid starts out of those guys. Savali, I don't really trust at all. I know he's going in the, the first game of the doubleheader today, but, you know, in the playoffs, you don't need five starters. So as long as they can get Plesak and Quantrill serviceable for the playoffs, then then you're all right. And obviously the back end of the pen, uh, Eli Morgan earlier in the year was pitching great. He has struggled lately. Uh, Karen Cech, who was fantastic when he first came up, and he was terrible the second half of the last year after they started checking the baseballs. And then he was hurt early this season. He was in the minors briefly. Well, he's been really good of late. Um, now 28 strikeouts and 15 and two-thirds. And, of course, um, we all know that uh, Emmanuel Classe has just been absolutely lights out. Um, he's given up just seven runs, and and not for a while. And, and he has become... You know, I know coming into the season, I was high on Class A. I know my man Jay Crawford was worried about him, didn't completely trust him, and and he's turned his just like I've turned, just like Josh Naylor. Uh, Jay loved Josh Naylor. I was lukewarm on on Josh Naylor coming into the season. I wasn't convinced he was a, definitely a starter. I've come around on Naylor. Jay's come around on Class A. Loved Class A coming in. Love him even more now. This guy is one of the most reliable pitchers. One of the most reliable closers in all of baseball. And and the Guardians, much maligned, maybe not as obviously as talented as some of these other teams. All they keep doing is winning. That's it. They just keep winning. We could talk about the low payroll. They keep winning. We could talk about not making moves to get better. Something I've talked a lot about and complained a lot about. They just keep winning. And yeah... With 48 games, what I say, 48 games to go, they'll probably hit another slide at some point here. That's just been their season. They get hot for a while. They get cold for a while. They get, it, we, we've seen it all year. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if they went into a, another funk at some point down the stretch. But I'm hoping it doesn't happen. And if it does, then it's it's a shorter one and not a longer one. We don't need a, a ten out of, you know 10 out of 12 losses. Can't have that. But uh, got an opportunity to keep piling up the wins here. 
You got a, 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 a seven-game homestand. The Tigers for four. They don't really have much in pitching. Um, and then you, you're facing the White Sox for three. After that, that's a three-game home series before you go on the road, and uh, it's a tough road trip. I, I, this is a big homestand because the, the, the road trip is not long next week, but it's a really tough road trip because you go to – it's you're going on the West Coast, and you go to San Diego. First, you go all the way to San Diego. Then you go all the way up north to Seattle. And, you know, those are two pretty good teams. It, it, obviously, the Guardians haven't been as good uh, on the road. So it's a tough challenge I, I, coming up next week. So they really need to pile up these wins against the bad Tigers. You know, a mediocre White Sox team, we'll see. And even the next homestand is challenging as well because the Orioles are another team that's a shocker. And I got to say, um, as as big a surprise as the Guardians have been, I, I would argue that Brandon Hyde, the manager of the Orioles, at this point today, is, and, and you folks know how much I love Francona, the Mariners have done a great job. They've, they've been a surprise. Scott Service deserves some credit there. I would say Orioles manager Brandon Hyde today, now they're, you know, if they end up 10 games under 500, which they very well could, I would change my mind. But if I had to vote for manager of the year, it'd be tough. But I'd vote for Brandon Hyde of the Orioles because as much as I thought the Guardians would be middling, I thought the Orioles would be in the American League East. I thought they'd be 30 games under 500. I thought they'd be a 60-win team. They got 59 wins already. So he'd be my manager of the year. So that's, again, so the Guardians, after this week, it's a tough schedule. And so you hope they can have a really nice homestand because you're going to get challenged because the next uh, 12 games after that, four in, uh, two in San Diego, four in Seattle, then the Orioles for three at home and the Mariners for three at home before you go back on the road, Kansas City, Minnesota. Uh, to You know, you still got Tampa Bay before the end of the season. You still got a big, uh, big long five-game homestand against uh, a home series against the Twins in the middle of next month, about a month from now. It's going to be fun. I'm excited about this team right now. And, you know, I know a lot of people have been complaining that there's not been a lot of Guardians talk in this town because most of the people that, that do – uh, sports talk in this town don't know squat about baseball and they're scared to move away from football and you know on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show obviously we talk a lot of football that's our number one topic because the Browns are the most popular team we get it and that's why I talk about the Browns a lot on this podcast but today and I'm going to get to the Browns in the podcast but today I wanted to start with the Guardians because I think they deserve the conversation and as much as I've been critical of the owner and frustrated that the team hasn't spent and you know and and yeah, had the Guardians gone out and got another bat and another arm, I'd like their chances even better. But uh, this is a team playing playing good baseball right now. They're finding ways to win. They're well managed. They believe in themselves. They're confident. And I, I do think there's a very good chance they're going to win the division. I don't think it's over because the schedule. You know, they're, they're playing some tough teams. They're a young team. They've been they've been up and down. But so have the other teams. You know, I, I know that there's more veterans on the Twins and the White Sox, especially the Twins, but those teams have been banged up. They've been more inconsistent. Um, you know, it's not like those teams have, have cupcake schedules the rest of the way, too. Uh, but it's, you know, the Guardians and Twins have eight games against each other still left. Uh, all, all eight will be played between September 9th and September 19th. Eight games over an 11-day stretch. Well, really... Um, yeah, an 11-day stretch. Three in Minnesota and then five at home in Cleveland. That, that Those eight games are going to go a long way to determining who wins this division. But I really like the Guardians' chances a lot. All right, I'm going to take a break. When I come back, I, I will get to the Browns and their preseason opener uh, against the Jacksonville Jaguars. But first, I want to let you know that BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information, from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts, they have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or move, use your mobile device to learn more about the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. 
Hey, well, water break. Mm. All right. Got my Cleveland Spiders shirt on today. Would have been a more appropriate the team to been renamed the Spiders. But uh, you know what? Uh, the Guardians is growing on me. It's growing on me. I love this thing I got here. It's like a wooden plaque or placard. I don't even know. I don't know what the hell it's called. But I like it. I think it's cool. Even the, the logo, which I thought was awful at first, it's kind of growing on me. Maybe because the team's playing well. I don't know. By the way, I watched. Uh, I rewatched Creed. You see all my you know Rocky stuff. There's my Rocky thing, and I got another Rocky thing. I, I remember where to point because it's opposite there, right? Another Rocky thing there. But um, I rewatched Creed this weekend. It was such a good movie. Such a good movie, man. Creed 3 coming out in, uh, I think, in February. Anyway, uh, so the um, Browns played their preseason opener. I, I'll be honest, I don't even remember the score because I don't care about the score. I think they, did they win? I don't even remember if they won. That's how little I care about the final score of the game because it's meaningless. Yeah, they won 24-13. I, I'm not, you know, it's funny. People, are, of course, are, are reacting and, and, in my opinion, overreacting to Deshaun Watson's performance in this game. Um, Deshaun Watson obviously was lousy and the Browns were lousy with the first team offense. They couldn't move the ball. Uh, Watson was one of five for seven yards and Anthony Schwartz dropped two passes. Um, and it, it, the offense just didn't didn't look in sync early. And I so I, I said this. I'm like, this is part of the process. The preseason is part of the process. I just don't care. Like what? As long as guys don't get hurt, you know, which unfortunately happened, the Browns starting center Nick Harris gets hurt in the game. Why the Browns have not signed J.C. It looks like Harris is going to be out for the year. So why J.C. Treader hasn't been signed yet, I have no idea. By the way, I'm just realizing I never played the intro to my show. Should I play it now? I'm going to play it right now. Or maybe I'll just skip it. I never played the intro. I'm going to skip it. We'll skip the intro. Uh, it's already too late. It was 17 minutes into the podcast. I can't play the intro now. I, I dropped the ball on that one. But I think you'll survive. Anyway, so I, I tweeted that I just don't care. Like, it's five passes. It's part of the process. We already know Deshaun Watson's a good quarterback. Um, I, I understand. It's a new place. He hasn't played in a year. You know, maybe he's not going to be great right away. Who knows? Maybe he'll be rusty in the beginning. I know how good Deshaun Watson is. Anybody who knows football knows how good Deshaun Watson is. He's eventually going to be great again when he gets on the field. There's no doubt in my mind. If I'm wrong, then I'll, I'll own it and, and tell you I was wrong. But I, I doubt it. So why would any rational human being get worked up about five passes in the preseason? And I'm not even going to and, – and, yes, Schwartz had drops, but I'm, I'm not going to – you know, people always make the excuse for Baker and other guys. I don't care. Like, make plays. Watson didn't look good. He looked lousy. The offense looked lousy. That's so, you know, it's you'd rather them look good. I get it. You want to have some confidence. But the reality is the preseason is meaningless from our perspective. The preseason is a part of the process of getting ready for the season. The winning and losing is meaningless. The statistics are meaningless. Coaches are looking for certain things. Yes, Deshaun Watson didn't play well. Yes, the first team offense didn't play well. I say, who cares? And the angst and the and it's it's like I get it. You if you hate Deshaun Watson, I, you know we've gotten to a point now where um, you know, and we did this with Baker, and we we you know I, I had somebody say to me, well, if Baker had, had gone one for five, you would have killed him. You know, here's the thing about Baker, and and I have been hard on Baker for the last year, no doubt, and I take some cheap shots once in a while just to be funny. But the reality is, is I've said plenty of good things about Baker over the years. People can't see that because I've crushed him for last year. And at times I've been very harsh, very harsh. And I'm not a Baker fan. Um, but to say, like, I would have killed him for going one for five in the preseason. Come on. I, I, I've said for years, I don't give a crap about the preseason. The games don't matter. It, it, and when I say don't matter, they don't matter in terms of analyzing the team. They don't matter in terms of the wins or loss. Chris Rose, who's doing the play-by-play -play for the Browns on TV, part of the new crew, and they were great with Chris and Joe and Aditi. Um, 
Uh, Chris Rose is like, yeah, I don't remember the one preseason score ever. Of course not. He's calling the game. He's promoting the game. He's not, but he wasn't a phony about it. And I love that. The game doesn't matter. It matters for the for certain players preparing for the season. It matters in terms of coaches getting used to the routine of going through a game, players getting used to the routine of going through the game. Deshaun Watson going one for five for seven yards doesn't matter. It's not an indicator of anything or of any way that he's going to play during the season. It's silly to think it does. Don't make it more than it is. And this whole, you know, guys that impressed, I, I'm never impressed by anybody that does anything in the preseason, especially against backups. So, yeah, Josh Dobbs, did he do a nice job? Uh, yeah, he did fine. Um, so did Josh Rosen. The two of them combined to go 16 of 20 for 164 yards and, and a touchdown. yip de doo I don't want either of those guys playing in a game. I don't care. I'm not, you know, there's plenty of quarterbacks that have played well in the preseason. I don't care. Those guys played against third stringers and fourth stringers on a bad team. Uh, it wasn't even starters on a bad team. It wasn't even backups on a good team. You're talking about depth players who are many of who are not going to be in the NFL in a practice game. You got to keep this into in perspective. You know, so I I just can't get worked up one way or the other. You know, I, I the only thing I, that I could get worked up about maybe is if the you know the kicker stinks. Cade York got one opportunity and he made his field goal. And he made his three extra points. Good. He didn't kick a long field goal, and there's not the pressure of the regular season game. But so far, everything we've seen from Cade York makes you think he's going to be a good kicker. I got At this point, I got no reason to believe he won't be a good kicker. But until he does it in the, in the league, until he does it when it matters, I, I don't know for sure. And, 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 and certainly with the other positions, like, can anybody even – I would love, you know, obviously you're not listening to me live – um, but the guy who led the Browns in tackles in this game, I'm sure most fans have never even heard of the guy. His name is Dakota Allen. Has anybody heard of Dakota Allen? I, I, I'll be honest, I never heard of him. I'm not going to be a phony. He was a seventh-round pick of the Rams in 2019. Has anybody heard of Dakota Allen? Are we going to say Dakota Allen? Wow. Because every time we get overly excited about a guy in the preseason, like normally you know, <laughs> the guys that make put up big numbers late in preseason games very rarely make the team or make an impact. Yeah, you want to see what get, get, you get your first look at the rookies and, you know, see if they flash it all in moments, you know, show some good instincts like Martin Emerson Jr. did or Jerome Ford did. But you got to keep it in perspective. You really do. Because it's just this so little uh, reality um, in, in, into what the preseason means. All right. Uh, take one more break. When we come back, I got some more thoughts on Deshaun Watson. And I, I touched on it briefly, but I want to get back to uh, what's happening. What, what Joel Batonio said about J.C. Treader and, and are the Browns thinking about bringing him back. That's coming up right here. In the bullpen with Adam the Bull. So let me start with the Treader thing. Uh, Joe Batonio in camp yesterday said, basically said he believes, you know, without, he didn't directly say it, but he was basically insinuating that JC Treader doesn't have a job because he's the head of the players union. And, it's hard to argue with that. J.C. Treader was one of the best setters in the league last year. He never misses time. He fights through all kinds of injuries, and the guy just plays at a high level. He's probably a top five center still. At worst, he's a top ten center. He should be not only on a team, he should be starting. There's three teams off the top of my head, the Browns, the Bengals, and the Buccaneers, that he should all be starting for, and these are all good teams. Now, Nick Harris gets hurt. It's unfortunate. He's a young player, a lot of upside. We've liked what we've seen from him when he's been on the field. He gets hurt. He looks like he's gone for the year. And 
frankly, I mean, somebody said to me, I said, why, why haven't the Browns called J.C. Trash? Somebody said, well, he doesn't want to come back. Says who? Who? What credible sources said J.C. Treader doesn't want to come back? Joel Petonio yesterday, who would know better than any rando on Twitter, said, yeah, we'd love to have him back. I mean, would would, J- would Joel have even brought that up if he kn- if J.C. Treader wouldn't come back to the Browns? And I understand the Browns cut him. I get it. There might be some hard feelings there. But if J.C. Treader wouldn't had would, at this point, I, I don't think he is in a position to say, well, I don't want to come back to the Browns. And, you know, maybe if he has an option, maybe he wouldn't. And maybe if Tampa Bay, who lost their center earlier in the preseason in training camp, and maybe they're waiting to see how their young players do and whatever, and the, and the, uh, the Browns have this Ethan Pochich, I can't, can't remember how to pronounce his last name, who was, you know, Seahawks draft pick who they got, I think, before last season. And whatever. I mean, he started games in the league, but he's not J.C. Treader. I don't understand. I, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me that J.C. Treader doesn't have a job. And hopefully, if Nick Harris is out for the year, uh, for sure, the the Browns will go down that route because there's no reason not to. He's the best option, without a doubt. Uh, and it makes no sense that he doesn't have a job. But one last thing. You know, I have argued that Deshaun Watson should be able to play. I've argued. Um, I thought the six-game suspension was fair. Uh, I thought the league did the wrong thing in appealing, but they are going to, and he's going to get suspended for however many games he is. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really bothered uh, by the extremes in this situation. And yeah, listen, I get it. I get the people that don't think Deshaun Watson should play this year should be suspended for the year. This is a very sensitive subject. It's a very serious subject that sometimes we forget how serious the subject is. Okay. I, I also think it's it's in bad form for people who have been arguing with me that Deshaun Watson should play to try to defend him as if he's completely innocent here. Now, I've said time and time again, nobody knows for sure what happened in these situations except for Deshaun Watson and the women. Based on the information we have that I am aware of, it appears to me that Deshaun Watson is not a great guy. He crossed a line. He crossed the line probably with a number of women. I do think, and and it's not an easy conversation to have, um, but I think there are levels here. And I think sometimes when, when somebody like me tries to say, well, what he did was bad, but not everything should be... It, it's not like if you... It's almost like everything's put into one category and if you do any, you know, what he's accused of is bad, right? It's bad. He went too far. He was inappropriate. And then if I say, which I'm going to, that, well, he didn't rape anybody. He didn't hit anybody. It makes it seem like I'm saying what he did was nothing. It wasn't nothing. But it's not rape and it's not violence. That's a big difference. And that's why I'm okay with him playing at some point. Does he deserve to be suspended? I do think he deserves to be suspended. Am I going to argue that he's completely innocent and has been railroaded by these 22, however many women? No, I'm not going to argue that. I never believed he was railroaded. Um, But do we have to look at everything as black and white? And can we not acknowledge that there are levels to this? And just because there are levels doesn't mean the lower levels are nothing. It just means they're not as much as the higher levels. We have to acknowledge that. At the same time, on the other side, I think we should acknowledge that that Deshaun Watson is not an innocent bystander here. And his apology um, on the TV broadcast did not come off well. Uh, It looked very phony. It looked very forced. Uh, It looked like he was reading off a cue card. And he didn't come off sincere at all at all, and I don't think that helps the situation. But we've talked that to death, so I'll leave it there. All right. Uh, Make sure you're watching the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show for more conversation today and every weekday. Uh, This weekend, we're going to have our first Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show post-game show, our two-minute warning show. Uh, We'll tell you more about that this week. 
We're going to be doing that throughout the season for this second preseason game and throughout the regular season. Uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Adam the Bull. There you go. Uh, check out my Cameo profile. Check out my website, AdamTheBull.com. You can click on the Book the Bull tab. Hire me for weddings, uh, speaking engagements, whatever. I'm uh, open for certain things depending on what you want me to do. And I love doing the Cameo videos. I've been doing a lot of fantasy football ones that I've been having a ball with. So if you want me to and you know, pick your uh, your draft order or do some announcement for your fantasy league, happy to do it. Check me out on Cameo. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Where else? But right here in the bullpen with Adam the Bull.